Hello everyone, I'm Dean Cooper, the Global Energy Lead here at WWF. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the, the launch uh, of our Nature Safe Energy Report that we've just completed together with our partners in Clean Action. That's the, the coalition linking energy and nature for action. Now, before we start, um, I should mention that one of the key goals for this event is to receive as much feedback as possible. So we'd be very pleased to receive all of your questions and comments from whatever you hear during the, uh, the, the different presentations today. If there's any issue that you'd like to raise, please use the, the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the event today, but, but otherwise we can follow up with you if you leave your contact details in, in the, the messages that you you put on the Q&A. Now, I, I mentioned earlier our Clean Action partners, and, and I must thank them, as well as all the other contributors to the report. Clean Action is a, a coalition that was founded at COP26 in Glasgow in, in 2021, with the aim to raise the profile of the link between energy and nature, and to motivate action that's action that will help to minimise any damage to nature from the rapid clean energy expansion that the world so urgently needs. The Nature Safe Energy Report that we're launching today is intended to be the first in a series of clean action annual reports to highlight the issues we need to address and to track our progress. It's intended to provide a foundation for the action that must be implemented as a global priority. This annual report is, is very much a starting point, and we welcome all of your feedback, as I said earlier, to help guide how we can best follow up. Now, with that quick introduction, I'd like to pass over to the, the European Commissioner for Energy, who's Kadri Simpson. Kadri regrets that she can't join us live, but she's sent the following recorded message to confirm her support for Clean Action's objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and greetings from Brussels. I'm delighted to take part in the Clean Action Coalition webinar on the occasion of the launch of your annual report. Climate change continues to have a devastating impact on people's lives and livelihoods in the EU and globally. This was again demonstrated last year as we witnessed record high temperatures, droughts and forest fires. However, there are some positive news as well. 2022 was a good year for renewables. In fact, it was a record year. Wind and solar together generated 22% of EU's electricity. For the first time, they overtook fossil gas and remained well above coal power. New wind capacity and new solar capacity were installed in the EU, each with an increase of almost 50% compared to the previous year. Leading this change, were the millions of Europeans who have installed solar PVs on their roofs. However, to reach our ambition for renewables for 2030, we need much better years from now on, every year. To achieve the objectives of the Repower EU plan and to reach the recently agreed targets for renewables in the EU, we need to accelerate their massive deployment. It is clear that slow and complex permitting processes are a key obstacle for this and it has the potential to put at risk the achievement of our plans and targets. We have therefore taken comprehensive action to overcome the structural obstacles that stand in the way of progress. First, we are working on policy and regulatory en enablers, like uh, permitting procedures, which will become easier and faster. Under new laws, renewable energy will be recognised as an overriding public interest while a balance with the protection of the environment and the biodiversity will be maintained. In renewables acceleration areas, where the procedures will be much simpler and faster, we are asking Member States to exclude protected areas as far as possible and to carry out a strategic environmental assessment of plants within those areas to mitigate the environmental impacts. Outside of these acceleration areas, renewable energy projects will still be subject to a specific environmental impact assessment. 
Second, we are addressing renewable skills gap in our workforce. To give you an example, the number of households installing PVs on their roof could have been higher had it not been for the long waiting times. This was partly due to an insufficient number of installers. And finally, we need more investment in renewables in Europe. Our recent reform of the electricity market design will create better conditions for this. The decarbonisation goals and our energy security challenges have a shared solution. Homegrown renewable energy. Every kilowatt hour of electricity we generate from solar, wind, hydropower or biomass is one less that we rely on fossil fuels. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commission shares the priorities of the Clean Action Coalition. We are committed to protect biodiversity and minimising as much as possible the impact on it of further renewable energy deployment. Transitioning away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy offers opportunities to provide access to clean, efficient, reliable and affordable energy, while also protecting biodiversity. This will be our message also at COP28, when the parties again gather for a global stock take after a turbulent year. A similar message to step up renewables has been made by the International Renewable Energy Agency and last weekend by the G7 in Sapporo, where we agreed on a target for 150 gigawatt of offshore wind and a collective increase of solar PV to more than one terawatt by 2030. The challenges ahead of us, the energy crisis, the nature crisis and the climate crisis are existential, but can be tackled with resolve and determination together. I am looking forward to working towards a healthier planet with like-minded allies like the Clean Action Coalition and again would like to congratulate you on your annual report. Finally, let me wish you excellent discussions. Thank you. So I'd like to say thanks again um, to Kadri Simpson, um, the Commissioner for Energy at the European Commission. We're obviously very pleased to hear such a positive message from the Commission, who clearly recognise the link between energy and nature and the need to take relevant action. Having heard these views from an international perspective, I'd, I'd now like to pass over to the Head of Global Climate and Energy at WWF, Mr Manuel Pulga Vidal who can help us to understand some of the related issues, particularly at the national level. Manuel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, Kadri, for your message. And thank you to you all for being part of today's event to present and to know and to share some ideas around an important report. And let me say that I think that this is an opportunity to celebrate. It is an opportunity to celebrate first because of the coalition. This coalition linking energy and nature for action, it has been fortunately a great decision, a great decision of key actors in trying to converge our climate objective by promoting renewable energies, but with our biodiversity or nature one, mostly in a time in which we have already adopted a good global biodiversity framework with new, strong and ambitious a clear targets. The second reason it is because of the report. And this report, Nature Safe Energy Linking Energy and Nature to Tackle the Climate and Biodiversity Crisis, it is, in my point of view, a very well written, well developed, well organized report. I, I really congratulate the authors. I congratulate the coalition because of this new report. And I encourage you all to read it and to share it in your network, because I think that it is addressing some important element of continue promoting renewable energies with protecting or as protecting biodiversity or nation. And the third reason to celebrate it is because we have Teresa Rivera. And, and, and you all know very well Teresa. Teresa is a very good friend. Uh, we know how much Teresa it is working in the energy transition and how many challenges you are used to having every day, Teresa. Uh, as I told you some days ago, I am used to following you because El País have a saying many, many uh, Spanish uh, newspapers. 
And I know how challenging it is for Spain, the energy transition. And as you know, Teresa it is the third deputy prime minister of Spain and minister of ecological transition and demographic challenge. So Teresa will take the floor with some remarks and after that we will open a short conversation around her topics. And after that, we know that Teresa uh, has to go because she's now out of town and, and she has many, many other things to do. So we appreciate, Teresa, your willingness, your support, and your contribution to today's event. So, Teresa, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. It is my great pleasure to join you in this very important conversation. And I think it is a very good idea to, to keep on building alliance and partnerships, uh, coalitions for clean energy, uh, for a, a proper development of the renewable energy in harmony with um, the biodiversity protection, the ecosystems, and the, the social challenges, the access um, of the local communities to the advantages of counting with a, on a much more clear energy system. And I think that um, this is more or less uh, reflected in the way you have uh, organized the gathering today with different stakeholders, policymakers, business developers, civil society, investors. So the whole community being involved in this uh, passionate uh, challenge, trying to do things in the, best, um, in the best way, how we can improve the current situation, how we can perform much better, and how we can combine and balance properly the different um, elements that uh, are part of this, um, of this uh, uh, pathway. And um, I think that uh, bearing in mind that there may be different perspectives, different views, ensuring that there are context gatherings where we can exchange views is very, very important. I think that um, this is part of um, the explanations why things have worked reasonably well in the last years. We have uh, witnessed a big push to accelerate the energy transition for very good reasons. First of all, as um, you were commenting, because of um, the very serious climate concern. This is not anymore something to discuss. This is something that uh, we are already experiencing with, um, with a big impact uh, in social terms, in environmental terms, but also in economic terms. I like the sentence um, introduced in the IPCC assessment report, um, six assessment report synthesis saying that um, what we will be living tomorrow will depend on what we do today. So we have a clear signal that we do, we need to do much more today if we want to, to live in better conditions tomorrow and not to be exposed to the dramatic effects of um, a climate uh, changing and, and creating uh, extreme conditions in many parts of the world, in many periods of the year. The second good reason why this, um, a, um, renewable energy deployment is um, accelerating is because of the energy security imperative. We knew that uh, we could not bear with the volatility of um, natural gas, coal and uh, oil prices. We knew that uh, it is unsecure in terms of who provides what, who supplies what, how we can accept to this, how this impact in our economy. But um, finally, when Putin uh, taking the decision to invade Russia, uh, Ukraine, we have witnessed uh, what, uh, what fragile we all are and how the different uh, consecutive uh, uh, effects are taking place, uh, how there may be reactions that uh, challenge the way that uh, we have taken this as something that could be more or less certain, more or less predictable. It is not anymore. It is a good reason why we need to accelerate the energy transition and to be sure that uh, the sources that we use um, are in the nearby and do not create additional tensions in our system, in our economy, and in our societies. But the urgency to shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy is um, yeah, also challenging some other elements that are important for those uh, trying to build a much more balanced approach uh, to, to a sustainable future, to a sustainable present. The deployment of the renewable energy solutions means that we do not have any more a few big plants, but lots of small size or a, a little bit bigger plants that are relevant uh, for the whole system, micro solutions, 
middle-sized solutions and bigger solutions. We cannot do this at the expense, at the cost of creating um, tensions in the biodiversity and in the ecosystems. We know that, of course, there is no perfect solution that covers all the things and that does have no impact. Of course, we always have an impact, but we need to combine things in such a way that uh, we take into consideration first that the best impact for ecosystems protection is not counting anymore on things that harm the climate system. But second, that there are good options to moderate the impact that the and renewable energy solutions may have in the concrete, in the more species ecosystem. So how we can combine things in a different manner? Probably the legislation was not um, adopted in the context that we are going through right now. So we need to update a little bit what we think, how we can combine, how we can measure, how we can ensure the best possible solutions, because we need to avoid the biodiversity loss, because we need to be aware of the risk of um, counting on unsustainable extraction of natural resources. So dealing with raw materials, dealing with ecosystems is something that is increasingly important in the public debate. And I could say that this is good news because the type of uh, transformation that we are promoting is not just a technological transformation or a nice business case. It is a societal transformation we need to take into consideration the different elements and to be sure that the way we debate is always for the good reasons, it's always trying to reach the best goals, but trying to ponderate, to balance the different elements into the discussion. We need to acknowledge all power sources are subject to generate some impact, and even the cleanest ones may have an impact on ecological functions, but we need to identify how and to what extent we can um, do this in the best possible way. The environmental and social risk in terms of impacts is always part of the discussion at the local level. And in order to provide the right answers, we need to update the institutional frameworks aimed at protecting critical resources and habitats. So for instance, if there is a huge ecosystem treasure, we should preserve it. If there are impacts that can be balanced uh, and can be secure, it may be worthy. And in any case, we need to assess. The technological innovations to reduce risk and impacts, the social innovation to be sure that there is a capacity to absorb or to accept this new neighbor in the village is also important. Environmental and social softwares have become a very relevant issue when dealing with the deployment of renewable energy. So we have some challenges ahead of us. These tools are not similarly developed and available in all countries. We need to learn. We need to share our lessons. We need to, sell, to share our concerns, but also the solutions. Even in the best case scenarios, some challenges may persist. For instance, the new energy projects need to be placed in the right sites. The potential for power generation always exists, but what are the geographical conditions that um, show to what extent this needs to be bigger, smaller, here or there? The social license importance. The social license matters in this discussion. The local communities need to take this as a good opportunity for them. Of course, there could be public benefits in the whole development of the renewable energy solutions. But can we think about concrete additional benefits for the local communities? It could be very important. Here in Spain, we are trying to identify how we can combine all the challenges in improving our capacities to define zones to create a mapping that uh, warns on the red light for those ecosystems that are particularly protected, orange light or green light, sorry, yellow light, so to assess in a way that uh, every precautory caution uh, principle is taken into consideration, but at the same time, we can speed up the answers. Some guidance coming from policy makers need to provide further guidance to potential developers and to the local communities. The universal environment and social safeguards take part of this discussion and the transparency and reporting on how this is affecting, impacting in the communities is very important. So yes, we need to develop renewable energy solutions. Yes, we need to invest in the new generation so to improve the performance, to improve the materials that we use. But at the same time, 
we need to be sure that we have a comprehensive understanding on how to combine things in the most suitable and smart manner. So thanks a lot, Manuel, for having this opportunity to share with you all some of um, the current lights of our discussion on how to be sure that um, this is a success story from the social, environmental, and economic perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. As we had expected, fantastic. Fantastic as always. Thank you very much. So we have eight minutes with you. Just to, 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 to make you a couple of questions. The first one it is related to your position as Minister of an Ecological Transition Ministry. Because you have referred well on the importance of working in institutions, in adapting and adopting well institutions to the new challenges of the world. So in your hands, you have energy and you have environment. How useful for the world or we think in the institutional government or governance, no, it is to join those two topics, to put it together, to have some authority leading with both topics at the same time, as it is happening, fortunately, in some countries, as in Spain, I think that in some way in Costa Rica, France, among some other, but not too much around the world. So how much do you suggest to join these energy and environment topics into the same set? the same ministry as a way to deal with these kind of challenges? Well, I think that um, someone dealing with a, um, environment and ecosystems protections is fully aware of um, the, um, the great impact that our energy systems do have uh, in biodiversity loss or in um, increasing the, the risk of not counting on the adequate conditions to preserve. Um, the ecosystem. So the, um, the natural trend um, provides a, a good reason why to, to, to be in favor of the development of the renewable energy solutions. Uh, at the same time, um, we know that this is not just black and white. Uh, there are many uh, challenges in the middle that we need to address properly if we want to, to do things in a smart manner. I was um, referring to, to the impact of the type of materials that we need to, to make this revolution happen and how we obtain these materials um, and uh, how we can think about uh, the, the best possible manners to do mining or recycling of raw materials or to keep on investment, the investment, sorry, in uh, innovating in new potential materials that can substitute those that uh, that are more complicated or more harming. That's uh, at the very uh, high level of the, of the upstream value chain. Uh, but then we have um, more um, difficulties when trying to identify the concrete discussions in the concrete ground about what type of project we need to, to put in place, what are the limits of those plays, and how we take into consideration the social concerns in this discussion. What um, we are trying to, to figure out is all the lessons that we can draw from 25 years um, implementing and uh, making uh, fully uh, functional the environmental impact assessment of the projects that have been forward um, along the, this, this, these two decades and a half. Because I think that that provides um, good knowledge on what it has worked and what it has not worked as well as we expected. And um, I think that... Uh, this is uh, part of the discussion that we are uh, um, witnessing today. The uh, skepticism coming from some local groups thinking, hey, I, uh, the landscape is part of my soul, is part of my history. The ecosystem that, um, that is around in my, my village is part of like, what I want to preserve, which is quite, I would say, quite normal. I, I think that that's part of, um, of our own personality, our own character, and it's difficult to, to, to identify why um, we need to, to, to touch on that. At the same time, I think that uh, sometimes there are some contradictions. There are highways, there are um, other type of uh, farming um, uh, techniques that uh, do have a um, more relevant impact or uh, thinking on people going down in a mine, in a coal mine, or um, getting flooded by a dam uh, in, in some areas, in some valleys, 
mm -hmm. uh, has always got a terrible impact. And, and I think that we need to, 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 to weigh things um, in, a, in a way that uh, proportionate um, a balanced approach. I think that uh, when thinking about the development of a wind farm or when thinking about the development of a pot photovoltaics plant, uh, we need to assess the right size uh, we need to introduce the best practices. Of course, if it is on a soil that um, has already gone through uh, some previous uh, type of deterioration, maybe maybe um, maybe easier. But probably this this is not enough. We can go into the very small developments, but as I said, there may be need for bigger plants. So I think that uh, some update on how we assess all of this, to what extent these um, these activities. Um, can be reconciled reconcile with, with other activities at the local level and to what extent there is an ownership coming from the local communities could also be very important, very relevant factors in this discussion. So the combination of ecosystem biodiversity and landscape concerns with the need to respond to our energy needs. And, and this is also fair. It, it cannot be that some contribute a lot with their landscape, ecosystems, and ground, and some others do not contribute at all, but benefit from that energy. Sounds like very, very unequal and very unfair. So I think that everybody a little bit is much more fair than only a few ones contribute a lot and the others do not contribute at all. Um, but as I say, we need to enter into the details and we need to find the best way to create um, a, a good social support to this, to this transformation, which is positive, immensely positive, but still with some challenges to be solved. Yeah, fully agree, Teresa. Teresa, I remember that probably it was eight years ago that we were together, actually, you invited me for a discussion around the energy security concept uh, within the EU. That was seven, eight years ago. Interesting, I think, for sure, a different time of what we are currently suffering. And you have referred to energy security mostly because of the consequences of the Russian invasion to Ukraine. And by now we know that to talk about energy security means that we have to cooperate. Cooperation, it's becoming a key element of the energy security. How much a new concept, a new phrasing of energy security should include climate considerations plus nature consideration? Do you think that energy security as a concept, it's evolving, or it has to evolve in, in, in a way in which it could be more comprehensive of geopolitical difficulties, but also climate and nature considerations? I think that um, in 1000%, in uh, we need to update and to understand energy security in a much more comprehensive uh, way, as I was saying, um, not so far ago, uh, people uh, refer to energy security as security of supply of raw materials, uh, raw energy materials that can ensure electricity work or can ensure cars uh, moving around or can ensure heating our houses. And that was all. There was no reference to the impacts on health. There was no reference to the impacts on the biodiversity losses. Or there was no reference to the climate security. And I think that this is changing dramatically. The, the very curious thing is that um, at the end, uh, probably, and this is very clear in Europe, but I think that uh, it is increasingly clear in many other countries too, in Europe, because we have this war um, next to our door in, in Ukraine. And um, the reason why the energy transition has been accelerated and the deployment of renewable energy solutions is very much in mind um, everywhere is because of the very traditional concept of energy security because of the total um, uh, blocking uh, access block access to the natural gas coming from the pipelines from Russia and the risk of not counting on the oil coming from Russia or the risk of not counting on the coal coming from Russia or the uranium coming from Russia so it is it is quite a um, symbolic thing at the end, uh, this, is, this has been um, uh, an accelerator of um, the understanding of why it is important to, to change um, the paradigm and to identify other references. At the same time, 
there is also this undergoing discussion on not to change some bottlenecks by some other bottlenecks, some vulnerabilities by some other vulnerabilities. So the geopolitical dimension of what we talk is also important. And when I say some bottlenecks and some vulnerabilities being exchanged, I'm referring to this concern of, well, okay, but in the state of the art of today of the renewable energy solutions, we need certain raw materials. And we, we need access to certain goods, to serve certain equipments. Where are these equipments being produced? Where are these raw materials being obtained? And who owns the, um, the, the market, who has a relevant position in this global market of these raw materials? And then something that was mm, fantastic from the perspective of uh, providing solutions that uh, do work um, in a cooperation mood and that do facilitate the access and the use of the, um, of the solutions and the, and the elements that uh, surround each of the local communities and do not need to, to rely on, on other players all over the world becomes a little bit tricky because things have been accelerated and are becoming very intense in a very short period of time. So I think that we need to concentrate on how we can um, create alternatives and reduce these vulnerabilities, how we can identify new materials or additional performance, as I was saying, and how we can recover this spirit of cooperation instead of um, the spirit of um, conflict or accident to, 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 to very scarce, scarce uh, raw materials. But I guess that, um, that um, our mindset is evolving very fast and that um, the um, willingness to, to be part of, uh, of, this, um, of this energy, new energy dimension is uh, quite spread all over the world. So yes, I think that um, the concept is changing very rapidly. Um, it covers many other aspects that were not covered by the traditional dimension of energy security. Um, but um, at, the, at the same time, um, it is also true that um, there are some elements that uh, need to be work a little bit further. For instance, and, and I end with this comment, um, something we have identified uh, with as a very relevant issue. Do we have the professionals that we need? Do we have the skills that we need? Uh, it's not just that uh, we change a coal plant by a, a wind farm and everything works in the same manner. No. It's not the case. We need different skills. We need different requirements coming from the grid. We need different uh, capacities to, to make this um, farm being operating. And, um, and uh, we, we need that um, our citizens are educated in this new way to, to solve the, the, energy, the energy requirements. Um, but also new energy business. If uh, there is wind, if there is photovoltaics, and we do not want to multiply by two or three the installed capacity, we need to develop um, the business case for storage and we need the, the, the systems, the methodologies to ensure that we can store electricity or use this electricity to when, when we are not consuming it to pump water or to produce hydrogen. So things um, become quite uh, attractive, but, uh, but uh, at the same time uh, require a, um, a new strategic thought on what energy security means and how we can respond to, to this um, to the new, uh, new future. Great, Teresa. Teresa, do you have time for one more or you are running now? I have to run. I'm so sorry, Manuel. No, but no, I'm, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we will have passionate conversations on this topic still for a while. So my um, congratulations and my gratitude for having the chance to join you for, for this um, for this small time, but uh, happy to, to do it again uh, sooner than later. Thank you, Teresa. We really appreciate your contribution, your masterclass, all, all what you have mentioned in relation to this link in between climate, energy, and nation. I think that you have brought great ideas great ways of thinking how to move and how to continue strengthening this link for the future. So thank you very much, Teresa. Hope to see you soon in, in any place of the world. Take care and, and, and see you. Thank you, Teresa. Good. So 
Fantastic. I think that it has been a great, great beginning of today's event. So now back to you, Dean, before moving into also, I, I am sure, a fantastic panel. Dean? That's great. Many thanks, Manuel. Um, it, no, it really is great to hear that there's just growing recognition at the policy level, both nationally and internationally, of the global trilemma that we all need to address. That's the link between energy, nature and the climate and the need for practical solutions. Um, so it seems that Spain understands very well the need for all of us to, to meet this challenge from the social, economic and the environmental perspectives. Um, so I'd now like to pass over to, to Leon Benon, who's the, uh, the chief scientist at the Biodiversity Consultancy in the UK. Together with Clean Action, Leon's team has co-authored the Nature Safe Energy Report. So we've asked him to give you an overview of some of the report's key contents. So um, over to you, Leon, thanks. Thank you very much, Dean. And thank you, uh, Teresa, for setting the scene so well. So it's a pleasure to give a brief overview of the report. I'm going to try and share my screen now. Hope that's visible. That looks good, thanks. Let's put it where I can see it as well. Great, so there's a lot in the report. I'm going just to give a very quick overview of some of the key messages, but really encourage you to have a look for yourself if you can. So what is the report trying to do? It's showing how this urgent transition that we need to renewables is an opportunity to reset the relationship between energy production and nature. It's looking at the different forms of energy and the impact on climate and nature. It shows that renewables, especially wind and solar, are much less damaging than using fossil fuels, even when you look at the full range of impacts that they involve. It comes up with recommendations for a range of audiences on nature-safe approaches to scaling up and concludes optimistically that supporting these technologies with the lowest impact on nature have major benefits and also be low cost. The report starts from the viewpoint of this renewables imperative. Uh, this, is, this figure is using um, uh, numbers from the Net Zero 2050 report by the IEA. And as with other similar impact pathways, it depends, getting to this net zero point depends on two main things. One is really deep electrif electrification of existing energy use, and the other is scaling up the electricity that comes from renewables as a proportion of that. So it means that renewables will be a much bigger piece of a much bigger cake. It has to go along with two other things, which is to increase energy efficiency across the board, but also to make sure we are providing modern energy to those who don't have it at the moment, as per the Sustainable Development Goals. And you'll see in that diagram a heavy emphasis on wind and solar, and that's mainly because those are the two renewable sources of energy with um, global availability and likely the lowest cost. What does that mean for nature? Well, this massive scaling up, which we require, will certainly have impacts, as well as the obvious ones on land tech. I just want to um, note a couple that are covered in the report because it goes into this in some detail. There are some species specific impacts in particular for wind in terms of bird and bat collisions, but also displacement, especially with offshore wind. Um, also, Offshore wind has impacts on some marine megafauna through noise temporarily during construction. And hydro has impacts as well as on the system as a whole, which can be very substantial on certain migratory fishes, which again can be very bad for those species. And then overall, there's this hidden impact, which Teresa also mentioned of where the materials come from for this and the impacts of, of that mining and extraction and processing for nature. What does that mean for these particular renewable sources? It's quite difficult to compare impacts. We can look at the, the direct impacts in terms of impact pathways. Those are the arrows at the top in this diagram from the report. The middle bit showing a life cycle assessment, which is probably a fair way to e examine and compare these different energy sources. because It looks at all the impacts from start to finish. And you can see that solar and wind in particular uh, look, do very well in terms of land transformation and ecotoxicity compared to fossil fuels, but also compared to bioenergy and to hydropower, and also have better in potential to mitigate those impacts and create native positive outcomes. Look at CO2 emissions, and not surprisingly, of course, uh, fossil fuels are way, way worse than the renewables, although biofuels are somewhere in between. 
the land use intensity, biofuels take up a huge amount of land, which is well known. It also means they can't really be relied upon as a cornerstone for nature safe energy transition. It can be used, they've been useful in certain circumstances, but not as the main plank. The circles for wind and solar there are perhaps a little bit um, misleading because, of course, this is looking at the whole area of a wind farm or a solar farm. And there's a lot of space in between the turbines and the panels, which can be and is already being used for producing crops and livestock or increasingly for nature restoration. There's other ways emerging like agrovoltaics, photovoltaics, as well as combined wind and solar farms that also help to reduce the space requirements quite usefully. Need to mention, as Teresa did too, the issue of storage. This is covered only rather briefly in the report. It's an area where technology is changing very, very fast. New solutions coming up. It's clear there will be need for both fixed and portable storage to back up uh, intermittent renewables. But the way the technology is developing, it doesn't look as though that requirement in terms of impacts will change the overall picture. So the report comes up with a number of recommendations and outlines these in detail uh, as to how we can take this, these findings and move on to a nature safe energy pathway. This diagram is uh, putting them into three main um, buckets, in terms of system change, policy and project level action. Those all overlap, of course, the boundaries are quite fuzzy. But I'll just go through a few examples from each with um, some of the things that are going on at the moment to show you how this is developing already. It's all very much a work in progress and solutions are being found. Key part of system change is to move to a circular economy so we can reduce those mining and materials impacts. That's really important. I think renewables have been rightly criticized in the past for not focusing very much on recycling and reducing material needs. This again is changing really fast with lots of new technological process progress that should enable us to make a big change in this in the very near future. Solar and wind in particular are also really suited to decentralized solutions, which Teresa also mentioned. That can help be helpful in a number of different ways. And for some parts of the world, such as large parts of Africa, for example, uh, mini grids or individual installations are going to be the way forward almost certainly. There's also a huge amount of potential for solar in particular to put them in existing built environments. Uh, car parks are one well-known example, but there's many, many other options, especially in the sunnier parts of the world, to put solar on buildings to really boost the electricity supplies in that way. On the policy front, it's really key that um, there is a strategic planning process to put these wind and solar farms in the right places. There's plenty of converted land out there that also overlaps with good solar and wind potential. Of course, converted land is usually being used for something already. But be careful not to displace um, those impacts somewhere else. But in principle, at least we can find the right resources in the right places worldwide. We need tools to support that spatial planning so we can move things away from sensitive areas. Uh, there's been a lot of progress on this too recently. This is uh, the example of Avistep, which is BirdLife's new tool that can use a state-of-the-art mapping based on a lot of new thinking in science. At the moment for Southeast Asia and East Asia, but this is going to be covering the rest of the world soon, we hope. And countries are using this already to plan their renewables developments. South African example here, these, these approaches take the resource constraints, economic and social um, considerations and the sensitivity mapping to work out where the right places are and direct development in those directions. There will still be residual impacts. It's very important that we try to have a, a joined up approach to compensation as well, because we want to be making sure that we're achieving global goals as per the, the global biodiversity framework. An example from Kenya here, where the Capetta wind farm is offsetting potential impacts on vultures by an integrated anti-poisoning program. That's working across the landscape at a very large scale as part of a bigger effort. So it's easy to scale and other developers can come in and join in. So it's all working together for the same purpose. If you're wondering what that cow is up to in the bottom right hand picture, uh, there's an ice pot being painted on its behind, which is proving to be an effective way of deterring lion predation and reducing human wildlife conflict and incidental poisoning. We obviously need robust safeguards. These aren't in place in many countries, and indeed not for all development banks either. And even the ones that are there don't often cover the full supply chain. 
And again, the issue of materials is really key here. We need to make sure that where resources are coming from, the safeguards are also properly applied with full traceability. Trace also touched on the thorny issue of cross-boundary energy sharing and energy security. While clearly there's, there's lots of politics behind this, the need for energy cooperation is also clear. And from the nature point of view, this makes a very big difference because it allows you to work out where the best places are, the lowest impacts and the best resources that combine, and also obviously improves reliability and reduces the need for backup. At the project level, mitigation hierarchy is absolutely key. I won't go into detail of the details on this slide, just to say the technology again is advancing really rapidly here. And the, bot the top right picture there shows some of the um, existing technology for automated detection and shutdown that with all going well should be fitted to most new turbines in the near future. That makes sure that you can detect variety species and shut down turbines before those birds or other species collide. There's also a great scope for nature positive on-site enhancement, especially when you're looking at degraded land or sea to start with. Just a few examples there from onshore and offshore. Again, the expertise here is growing very fast and has a huge amount of potential. And finally, to emphasize the really crucial need to monitor and share results, we need to understand what the impacts are and how well we're doing at producing them, especially in parts of the world where these technologies are quite new without a lot of data behind them. Um, there are now well-established protocols for how to go about this, and I think um, BirdLife and other um, NGOs with, working with government to try and set up these uh, cross-regional cross approaches to uh, tracking impacts and sharing data, which need to be enabled by policy and regulation as well. So the key messages in summary is that all energy systems will impact nature, including renewables, but renewables do far less damage once you look at the whole picture than fossil fuels. We have to scale them up hugely to avoid the worst risks of climate change, but supporting the ones with the lowest impact has major benefits and can be low cost. Strategic integrated planning is key, get things in the right places, alongside the mitigation hierarchy being implemented rigorously. And in principle, at least there's enough energy available on low conflict sites to meet renewables targets. But we do need these underpinning processes to improve energy efficiency, move to a circular model for materials, and at the same time, decentralize and share energy grids to support this nature safe renewables transition. That's a really rapid canter to the report. There's lots more there. I hope you will take time to look at it, but I hope that's given you a taste of what the report contains and some enthusiasm to go and look for yourselves. And I'll stop sharing and hand back to Dean. You, you are on mute, Edding. Oh, let me try again. Um, thanks for, for letting me know. Um, and thanks, Leon, for um, managing to cram as much information from the report into the short time that we have available during this, uh, this launch event. Uh, I'd certainly encourage, as you, as you said, just encourage everyone here to download the report from the Clean Action site um, or uh, on the link that I think um, has been provided in the, in the uh, chat. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, please incorporate some of these, these details into your own thinking from the, the global clean energy expansion that we need to see very, very soon. So with that, let me pass back to, to Manuel, who's now together with our panelists to consider some of the nature safe energy issues from the perspective of different stakeholders and different regions around the world. Um, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Leon, for a great presentation and, and, and summarizing the, the report. So fortunately, now we will have a fantastic panel <clears throat> from different stakeholders, sorry, <clears throat> different stakeholders representing different regions and different sectors. So this, I am sure, will be a good way to have different visions, different approaches related to the main objective of the report, that it is to link our energy effort with nature and biodiversity protection. So I will introduce all of them. And after that, we'll give the floor to each one of, of them for two minutes. And after that, I will make probably some questions to, to, to you all and open a Q&A 
for all the audience. So you can use the icon in the bottom of your screen and formulate your question. And I will channel it to uh, whatever it would be the, 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 the destinatory of, of, of that question. So let me introduce all the panelists. We have Amy Philanison from Orsted. Uh, Orsted, as you know, it is strongly working in this concept of net positive biodiversity impact in their activities. I had the opportunity to talk with the CEO of Orsted while in Sharm el Sheikh in the COP27, and we discussed uh, how important and how much Orsted is working in permitting and citing as a way to secure and to manage uh, the potential impact that the deployment of renewable energies could have. Also, we have Gonzalo Sainz de Miera. Gonzalo, it is from uh, uh, Iberdrola. Uh, he is uh, the director for climate change and alliances. So Gonzalo, probably I will come to you uh, after the participations with some questions because we will represent the private sector, it is Amy. But thank you, Gonzalo, for taking your time for being here. Iberdrola also, it is an active actor in connecting climate and nature. After that, we will have, with a civil society uh, perspective, Eugene Formwa. Uh, he is the Just Transition and Energy Access Lead at the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, PACJA. Then we will have a finance perspective coming from Duncan Lang from the Asian Development Bank. He's senior environment uh, specialist from the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Thank you, Duncan. And finally, we will have the research perspective coming from Steven de Greer from the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Science. He's a senior environmental scientist. So thank you very much to you all for your participation. So let's start with you, Amy, if you can adjust your time to two, two to three minutes. And after all the uh, presentations, I will make some questions to you all. Amy, you have the floor. Thanks, Manuel, and thanks to WWF, TBC, and the wider Clean Action Coalition for this important work. I'm really looking forward to building on it and working on the annual reports going forward. Um, so as we've heard, large scale deployment of renewable energy is a essential step on the path to net zero. And if done right, represents a huge opportunity to help halt and reverse biodiversity loss. I won't go into more detail on why, why that is the case. I would encourage people to look in, in the report, which is so well written. Rather, I'll focus on what do we mean by doing the energy transition right? What does biodiversity positive renewable energy look like for us? Um, there's a lot we could say here, but I've broken down into three key elements that we think we, we, we as industry really need to take seriously. The first is science-based decarbonization now. It's really the bedrock for credible action on nature and must come first, not least as climate change is a large and growing driver of biodiversity loss. Second, as we deploy the unprecedented expansion of renewables infrastructure needed, we will see more interaction with nature. So it is essential that we continue robustly to do what we can to avoid and minimize potential negative impact. And third, we think this is no longer enough we also need to set bold ambition and take action now to create positive impact on biodiversity where we can. That might be actions within the footprint of our uh, renewable energy infrastructure. It might also be action elsewhere, looking at an ecosystem-wide approach. Um, so I'll say a bit about what we are doing as one example of industry action in this space. So Arsted has added to our industry-leading decarbonization record 30 years of experience from delivering the first to the largest offshore wind farm, a bold ambition for net positive biodiversity impact that really sits at the core of our business strategy. That is that all renewable energy projects we commission from 2030 at the latest are to deliver net positive biodiversity impact. And we're already working hard to deliver on this with a wide suite of actions being integrated across our business. Um, three things investment in new and innovative restoration projects that will contribute to the development of a best practice toolkit for measures that work at scale, forging new partnerships with the conservation community to unite action on renewable energy and restoration, 
and working with the global scientific community on methodologies for measurement of biodiversity impacts and setting science-based targets for nature, because without these, it, we, we can't get this right. Importantly, we know that we don't have all the answers and nor do we have all the levers for change to enable this. Collaboration is key to overcoming the complex challenges involved and importantly, to enabling implementation of the right solutions at scale. So in short, we can collectively achieve more for nature and climate and faster if we act together on this. There's, there's a lot of, of different things that that means and some of it is pointed to in the recommendations and the report, but I'll just highlight the, the key action um, to this from policymakers. We need them broadly speaking to reflect the deeply interconnected nature of climate and biodiversity in their approach to implementing global and national goals. And we need to see incentivization of investment in biodiversity positive action and the deployment of renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Very well organized set of reflections. So I will come back with some questions after all the other panelists. So now I would like to pass the floor to you, uh, Eugene uh, Forwa from Patya, also for your reflections. Eugene. Um, thank you very much for, for having me for this uh, very important uh, discussion and for the launch of what I consider to be um, a very crucial report. Um, let, let me start by uh, stating um, what we consider to be the most important uh, challenge facing uh, the African continent where we operate. Um, it's the challenge of balancing uh, the need for expanding energy access to drive development and industrialization on the continent and the duty that the continent has to participate in addressing the climate crisis in terms of both mitigation and helping communities that are wreaked by extreme weather uh, to cope with those conditions. And in our work, we found that renewable energy is a critical component of this delicate equation as it can help the continent achieve both objectives. In this way, renewable energy is considered a necessity for the continent, especially given that um, the continent doesn't have enough energy to go around. In fact, Africa is now considered to be um, the home of energy poverty. When you look at the global figures, 75% of those without access to electricity, for example, are live in Sub-Saharan Africa. But also, uh, renewable energy seems to be an opportunity to transform the entire energy system into one that is more democratic, equitable, and respectful of nature. Now, we also must recognize, and I think uh, that's what uh, this report highlights, uh, that renewable uh, energy is not a silver bullet and that it can have negative impacts on nature if not planned and implemented carefully. Uh, we already know, for example, that large-scale hydro dams can disrupt river ecosystems and displace local communities, that wind farms can pose a threat to birds and bats, that solar panels can use up scarce water resources and create hazardous waste. Um, it's a good thing to note that, um, as um, uh, the presentation has shown, that there are efforts to address some of these um, issues. But I think what is going to be more critical for Africa is uh, the extraction of mineral inputs into renewable energy technologies that would require, in some cases, vast excavations and deforestations, especially from uh, places like the Congos, uh, where some of these resources are found. So we think that these uh, impacts can undermine the benefits of renewable energy and jeopardize the health and well-being of people and wildlife. And as civil society organizations, um, we, just to note uh, that uh, the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance is a coalition of organizations. So as this collective, uh, we think that there's a strong need and an urgent one uh, to raise awareness among civil society actors because they have a critical role to play in ensuring uh, that these negative impacts that we've described do not occur. But also to ensure that 
um, there is knowledge about the importance of integrating nature considerations in the decisions and actions of all actors, not only uh, civil society actors. We therefore need to ensure that renewable energy projects are designed and located in a way that minimize harm to biodiversity and ecosystems, and that they respect the rights and interests of local communities. And I think um, this speech is, is quite an important one when we uh, consider um, impacts of um, energy systems on nature and, and bearing in mind the conflicts that have existed in the past between nature and local communities, nature conservation and local communities, um, it will be very prudent to ensure that uh, there is a good balance between uh, these competing interests. We also need to ensure that renewable energy projects are complemented by other measures to conserve and restore nature, uh, such as protected areas, ecosystem-based adaptation processes, and nature-based solutions could help to achieve this. So like I've pointed out, there are a number of things that are critical uh, and that civil society can really lead in. And I've already discussed that awareness raising is going to be critically important. And the work that we do uh, can really bridge the knowledge gap between um, um, expert communities, uh, policymakers, and communities. But of course, there is need for strong advocacy um, for policies and regulations that ensure renewable energy projects are environmentally and socially responsible and that they respect the rights and interests of local communities. And finally, um, that there is support uh, to grassroots movements and groups that are promoting renewable energy solutions that are compatible with nature conservations, such as community-owned solar farms, wind cooperatives, and agroforestry systems. Um, I'm going to end here since we, we have other opportunities to speak. And uh, again, thank you for inviting us to join this conversation. Thank you very much, Yujin so important uh, topics as the impact of the minerals needed for deploying renewable energies. You mentioned to nature-based solutions. I will come back with some questions around those two topics. So now I would like to give the floor to you, Duncan, uh, from the Asian Development Bank. So it is about money. So, so what are the kind of incentives that we do need to promote investment, public or private investment, that can link our energy effort with nature protection. You have the floor, Duncan. Thanks. I think I think you should have invited a banker. Well, I'm an environment guy at a bank. <laughs> um, well, what I can say is that um, look, ADB has really um, made a big commitment. We're now calling ourselves Asian Pacific's Climate Bank. And so we're very, very keen to deliver um, a huge amount of money for climate financing. We have a target of 100 billion by 2030. And of that, 66 billion will be um, climate mitigation. So a large chunk of that is likely to go into renewable energy. That's kind of our goal. Um, so you have that on one side, but then you have on the other side that we want to make sure that you know that money is going to the right places and that really is a challenge um i didn't coin this phrase but uh at one of our events we had somebody who said we need to be clean and green and i think it's quite you know a good one really because that that's really what we need to do um at adb we have a lot of issues when we're trying to you know do these renewable energy projects with the way that they're set up um, which doesn't help from a perspective of looking after nature. Um, we will find a situation where the government has already identified a block of an area and therefore there's very little room for following the mitigation hierarchy, as Leon was saying, with avoidance being number one, what we want to do. Power purchase agreements are also there, which mean that there's really an incentive to try and do projects very quickly and feed-in tariffs are there as well, which incentivize that too. So those things are really challenging, um, as well as the ones that uh, Leon mentioned about the fact that there's very limited actual national requirements. So when a lender like us comes in and says, you need to do X, Y, and Z, then people get quite annoyed at us because they say, hey, it's just a you know, transmission line or it's a, 
a wind farm, there's no impacts on biodiversity. But we all know that that doesn't isn't necessarily the case, and we need to look at that. And so that's something that ADB is is taking pretty seriously. We're we're trying to, you know, scale up our work in this area. Um, I think Joe Kaisecker from the TNC produced a really great report uh, paper a few years back, which said if we don't, if we put wind farms where it's windiest and uh, solar farms where it's sunniest, we'll uh, jeopardize 11 million hectares of natural habitat, uh, 3 million hectares of key biodiversity areas, and put under threat one and a half thousand globally threatened species. So, you know, those kind of figures really made us sort of sit up and listen. And um, we we realized that we needed to do something about it. Um, my day job generally at ADB is looking at safeguards. So I'm part of the team will, that will go through the approval process for projects. And we often find that we're um, at a later stage in the financing of a project. And so we really needed to move upstream to try and work with our developers and for with our governments to look at ways by which they can actually avoid the impacts in the first place. So we've started to look into doing more SEAs at a country level to identify those areas that are, you know, high wind, but low risk from a biodiversity perspective. Um, we also funded the Avistep mapper that uh, Leon uh, mentioned earlier on in the, his, his uh, um, keynote speech. Um, so far, we've got that covering Vietnam, Thailand, India, and Nepal. And it also covers transmission distribution lines on and offshore wind and solar. It's also open access. So anybody working in those countries can use it. But as Leon said, we're hoping to scale that up. And I think that's something that we're really keen to do. Um, and the other thing that we're doing at the moment, which is probably worth mentioning, is that ADB is going through right at this moment, uh, strengthening our safeguard policy uh, statement. Um, this is going to be, we're going to our board in uh, spring of next year, and we will be significantly increasing it and updating it because our original policy came into play in 2009. So a lot has changed since then. And so we're trying to improve that to make sure that, you know, impacts on nature from renewable energy can be managed uh, well. So I think probably that's enough for me right now. Um, everybody needs to speak. So back to you. Manuel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, and, and congratulations that you are working in these safeguard policies. And, and I will come back probably with a question. Also, I would like to encourage the audience to formulate their questions in the Q&A icon. Some of those questions have been already uh, addressed, uh, but if you have something to ask to any of the panelists, please feel free to ask your question in the Q&A. So now uh, I would like to give the floor to you, Stephen. Uh, and I'm sure that you will connect science, technology, and all the importance of linking climate and nature. Yeah, thank you, Manuel, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, to contribute to this panel. And congratulations with the report. I quickly scanned it. I still have need to take some time to properly have a look at it, but uh, it looks very nice. And actually, when I was invited, I, I first started thinking about what it is, what, what kind of messages I would like to share with you. And it's only after that that I started having that, that I had a look at the uh, at the report. And the nice thing is that uh, what, what what well, you hopefully will get from uh, the intervention I'm uh, I'm about to, to give you now is that it, it, it actually nicely aligns. So we, on one hand side, if you have a look at the topics that I think are more are really important, and you look at the topics that are important as it comes from the from the report, nicely aligned one with the other. Um, well, my focus is rather on the offshore renewable energy, and particularly actually on offshore wind farms. So most of the reflections I will come up with are about this uh, this offshore renewables. And, um, and I think what what is quite important if you think about how to get, actually connect uh, or, or have offshore renewables coexisting with, uh, with with nature values, a very important thing ahead of uh, of whatever I'm going to say is that the knowledge base has tremendous the knowledge base to actually merge the both uh, or to, to tackle both crisis, the energy crisis, biodiversity crisis and the uh, climate crisis. The knowledge base for for doing that has tremendously grown for the last about 20 years, I would say. 
So uh, many monitoring and research program has gathered have, have gathered that much of uh, of information that we now start having a proper understanding, a mechanistic understanding about how the impacts truly work. You know the cause effect relationships, and it is our this mechanistic understanding of this cause effect relationships that really helps us identifying how we can efficiently and effectively mitigate adverse impacts, but also uh, promote positive impact while well, positive impacts are working. Uh, beneficiary impacts. So there was, uh, I think that the knowledge base is there. We know a lot and we can actually start, you know, taking those effective and efficient measures. Uh, if, if I first want to uh, focus on mitigating the bad, uh, of course, you know, as any um, human activity, uh, you know, it always goes with, you know, with some negative impacts. Huh? So, um, and those negative impacts of war or, or adverse impact, we have to try to mitigate them. Actually, we do not only have to try to mitigate them to the level that makes them acceptably negative. I think that our ambition should be to nullify those impacts. And for some of them, we can already do that. And we can already do that at the, uh, at the level of the project, of the project of, for example, an individual wind farm. Uh, and there are quite a lot of mitigation measures out there. We just have to embrace those uh, those mitigation measures and have them done. Uh, and if you look at the type of mitigation measure that also also nicely aligns with the report, as I have seen it, is that uh, it, it it stretches kind of the um, the wider range of the mitigation hierarchy. But many of them are really at the level of um, at the level of avoidance at the source. Uh, but also a, a abatement at the receptor. So it, there, there's quite a lot of things we can uh, we can do at that uh, at that level. Um, now, of course, uh, that is what we can do at the uh, at the at the project level. But uh, what we need to have is, of course, a societal buy-in of those things because those kind of measures they do not come at zero cost. They can be done at low cost, as also outlined, I think, in the report, but they do not come at zero cost at short term. They do come at at uh, they do come with the major gains, of course, at the at the long term. And we have to try to get this uh, this public the, the public on board. Um, and we can do that actually by so at the by eco-friendly designing of, for example, those offshore wind farms. We know what to do. Okay, well, if we actually carefully think uh, about those eco-friendly design, implementation, construction, operation, and so on, we can really avoid risk at, at smaller spatial scales. We have to be realistic, of course, that, that is that not all negative impacts or adverse impacts can be mitigated or can be nullified. So from that perspective, if we would stick to only taking measures at the individual project scale, we would fail. And that's why we need to actually look at it at the broader scale. But that has also been mentioned by many other panelists. Uh, what we actually need is an ecosystem-based spatial planning. And then actually we can do a lot. Indeed, avoid sensitive areas. It's a very good, it's a very good uh, starting point, but we can do, of course, much more. The point is that if you have this ecosystem-based uh, spatial planning, you can really avoid risk at larger spatial scales. So far for the negative impacts, with regards to the positive uh, impacts or um, beneficiary uh, impacts or beneficial impacts, um, if done properly, actually, I think that many, particularly offshore wind farms, I'm not that sure about uh, offshore renewables in the terrestrial environment, but if done properly in the marine environment, uh, wind farms can actually contribute to nature cons conservation, restoration, and uh, enhancement. And it, it, it's actually at two different scales that, that or two different types where it happens. On one hand side, you have this uh, offshore wind farms often coming with... Um, with restrictions towards other users, not at least active trawlers, though trawling fisheries. And actually by just excluding trawlers from uh, vast areas, actually you give the uh, room to the seafloor to actually recover from decades, from more than hundreds of years, quite often of, uh, of um, bottom or, or damage to, uh, to, the, to the benthic ecosystem. We also, some active measures can be taken, of course, uh, and it's also mentioned in the report, you know, nature inclusive designs, they are out there, there are quite good ideas about how nature inclusive designs could contribute to, uh, to the restoration of natural assets, yeah, um, actually. There is one risk in there, to my opinion, and that is that, um, and that is something that we are particularly confronted with in the marine environment, and this nature inclusive designs often leads to new nature. To higher levels, due to uh, 
uh, a higher number, for example, of species, but non-native species. Well, not only non-native species, but species that would naturally not occur. Right? And that's simply because you uh, add artificial substrate into quite often the soft substrate environment. So you kind of create something new in the, in the area, which is fine, but which cannot be used as a um, as an excuse to to uh, to further um, neglect the natural hard substrates we would we we would have in the uh, in the marine environment. Um, to finish up, actually, um, I think that that's the major challenge for the next uh, for the next decade decades. Um, there's quite a lot of new types of offshore renewables uh, that will pop up. So uh, we have tidal energy converters, offshore photovoltaics are now being tested as well. We do not have commercial scale projects, but they are around. Uh, floating wind turbines, uh, if you think about the grid connection, we're thinking about the uh, construction of artificial islands, and actually all of that substantially contribute to uh, some sort of an artificial hardening of the uh, of the marine environment. And of course, uh, because of that, uh, you know, you have accumulation of impacts. And I think that this accumulation of impacts, we have taken quite a few steps in the direction of an assessment of what these impacts could mean at the level of populations of marine mammals and also for, for some seabirds. But uh, there's quite a lot of uh, of, of of information that is lacking with regards to the cumulative effect of this hardening at really larger scale um, of the marine environment, for example, on fish. You know, there's still this debate on attraction and uh, uh, attraction of fish versus um, production of uh, of fish, and all of that is yet to be um, yet to be investigated. Um, I think that I will leave it here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Steven. Fantastic panel. Thank you very much for your different approaches. So we don't have too much time for questions, but let me formulate a couple of, of, of those. Uh, the first one probably it is more for you, Amy and, and Gonzalo. You can jump uh, if you wish in, into this one. So it is clear that we are not starting from scratch when we think about how to link the deployment of ener energy facilities, in this case, renewable energy and how to protect nature and, 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 and keep biodiversity integrity. We have learned many things for years, good things, bad things. Probably those trade-off uh, have been strongly presented in the hydro, in the development of hydro facilities in biodiverse uh, places as the Amazon. So what have we learned based on our experience with hydro those big dams that in many cases have extremely affected biodiversity. What should we do different by now based in that experience? I don't know if you, Gonzalo or Amy, would like to jump into that question. Lessons learned, it is something so important. Um, I can say a few words if Gonzalo, I, I can't see um, if he is. Still there? No. Um, so I can't talk specifically about hydro. It's not somewhere where we do a lot of work or something that's an, an area of expertise to me. But I, I think in terms of lessons learned, it's about not making mistakes of the past. So in rolling out the renewable energy transition, making sure that from the get go, when we're thinking from siting to operations, that we are thinking about uh, biodiversity and climate and local communities from the outset as, as we move forward. Um, I think that's that's the that's the big, I would imagine that's a lesson we can take from any any um, previous energy infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Stephen, do you want to, to take also that one? What have we learned based on our experience with hydro you know, that could help us to define better ways to, to protect nature when it is about energy facilities deployment. Is it, yeah, are you referring specifically to hydro or? Um... Hydro, hydro, yes, yeah, because we have learned a lot of things, good and bad things because of hydro. Yeah, in the terrestrial environment, we have learned a lot from uh, from hydro, of course. In the marine environment, of course, it, uh, it, it is not an issue. But maybe what I want to say may not really address your, uh, your question. Well, may, maybe only... Uh... <laughs> Slightly uh, or marginally, let's put it like that. But I guess that what we have learned uh, so far, and and, and uh, 
and that's really from an uh, from a nature conservation nature restoration perspective and a research perspective is what we have learned is if we want to properly um if we, if we really want to have eco-friendly developments of uh, of renewable energies then actually the ecology should be there or the ecological considerations should be there from the very early conceptual uh, conceptual uh, stages yeah so you have to think about ecology as soon as you start thinking about the development of uh, of uh, an, an energy plan for a country yeah and then of course it has to stay there so every single decision decision has to be has to, every single decision that has to be taken has to go with the consideration about what does that mean to ecology how could we actually also incorporate eco-friendliness into uh, into our plans into our designs into our construction operation and so on um that is what we have learned because what we now see is there is some sort of an uh, and that's also what we heard from the european commissioner is there is the tendency to really put a lot of effort and okay there are good reasons to do so a lot of effort to go fast with the uh, with the development of of, uh, of renewable energy uh, developments in in, uh, in in Europe, which is fine, um, but of course um, there is the risk that we first design and yeah that we first design the plan with regards to the renewables and only take into account ecological considerations in a second phase, and then actually you come too late. You lose opportunities if you do not have those observations. Those um considerations from the very beginning and i think that's that's a very important message message we have learned from the uh renewable energy developments in the marine environment but i think that it should also go for most likely for whatever is going in the terrestrial environment thank you thank you steven uh, eugene i am wondering what how should we address access to land when it is related to deployment of renewable energy, no? Put respect rights, no? People, who, what else should we do? Because that has been historically one of the main problems, the access to land with which title, no? Uh, with what kind of consultation? Could, could, could you share with us some ideas around that? Of course, um, the first thing we need to note is that um, land ownership is, 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 is a slightly um, different in Africa in the way communities um, own and claim ownership to land. Um, it's not strictly based on um, having in your hands a title deed to the land. It's, it's more of um, a historical occupation. It's more of a, an ancestral issue. And so the, the vast amounts of land that seem to be empty when, when you move across Africa um, have owners. And sometimes these owners don't, can't fully claim their ownership to these lands. And I think that's where uh, these conflicts are coming in. Uh, my thought is that the first thing we need to do is, you pointed out a, a little bit, um, is to increase the level of uh, consultations. Uh, what we see uh, in Africa is that once energy projects are framed as national priority issue, um, other considerations uh, become secondary. Um, land ownership, land occupation, and the fact that, and, and this is a very strange reality that in, in Africa, some of the poorest people, the only resource they have is land. And, and so if you took that away from them, you further push them into poverty. And so I think the level of consultation or involvement of local communities in this project is going to be crucial. In many instances, you wouldn't need large scale um, um, energy infrastructure if you wanted to address, for example, uh, the energy poverty in, in, in in, in communities that are far flung. And there it's, it becomes a lot easier to, to manage uh, the little land that's available, ensure that we have infrastructure that uh, provides um, energy services to specific communities. Um, there's been plenty of um, arguments in favor of decentralized or uh, over centralized energy systems. And, and if we did that, we could address some of the of the land rights issues 
but if I were to say what, in my view, the bottom line is, is that these we need to first recognize that these communities are stakeholders in this projects because they are providing the land on which um, these infrastructures are built, and therefore we need to treat them as such. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Ying. Uh, we don't have too much time, so a last question to you, Duncan. Duncan, you refer to the importance of having regulations to regulate, and, and also that is something that it was referred by Teresa. And, and also, Amy, you refer to SBTN. So my question is multiple. So first to you, Duncan, what kind of regulation, of new regulation we do need to develop? Because sometimes laws can sort things and sometimes not. And in case of, of SBTN or SBTI, despite uh, whatever it could be the, the standard, what are we expecting? Which new standard do you think that you do need to have more clarity on how to move things towards a clear target and clear objective? So first to you, Duncan, and then or Amy or Gonzalo. Um, well, one of the things I think that we've noticed is that the, the there's, as I said before, there's a general lack of regulations. Um, and I think this is something that needs to be addressed. You can't do it. Um, I mean, we operate in multiple different countries, so every country is different and how the regulations come in there. But I can tell you about one country which we've been operating in recently, where we identified that there was actually no permitting uh, in place for offshore renewables, which really set a problem because then actually the the um, there was no process. So they were sort of sat there saying, we're not approving this project, but there was no system by which they could actually submit an application to get an approval. So that kind of thing is the type of thing that needs to be addressed you know, all around the world in a way, because um, we need to make sure that those sort of permitting situations are done based on, you know, detailed um, assessments, and then the permitting, the authority that gives the permit uh, will have the, the knowledge that they're okay with the outcome and, and giving that approval. So I think we've identified that in, in, in a few situations. And um, We've often seen as well where one part of the government doesn't work with another, where the a block for an approval is given for you know renewable development, but it's actually overlaps with an area which is of high sensitivity, uh, and another part of the government is saying it shouldn't happen. So I think you know regulations need to be joined up, and spatial planning tools need to be put in place which capture all the different ministries and they come up with one, you know, approval system that, that then can be used by all the different organizations within a government uh, as they go through the approval process. Um, that's easier said than done, but, you know, that's the sort of thing we're trying to work with, with some of our governments um, in, in the developing world in, in Asia and Pacific. Um, back to you, Manuel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Amy, uh, 30 seconds if possible, because now we are running out of time. Yeah, so. it was just to add to that, that obviously the, you're talking about regulation. We can think about uh, obliging developers to do this in, in a way that's good for biodiversity or incentivizing them by reward. And I think one right. area that is important is uh, the tender criteria that are used by many governments to select offshore wind projects could far better incentivize a wider set of sustainable societal value such as positive biodiversity impact and not just focus on a race to the bottom on, on price for a technology that's already highly cost competitive. Manuel, may yeah, I? Well, hello, please. Uh, sorry for that, but I was, I'm connecting from a solar photovoltaic plant in Andalusia and it's so hot that the mobile phone stopped working. So just yeah. to add two messages for me is, the first is the sense, I completely agree with Amy, okay? We are doing a lot of things, but the sense of urgency, you know, we have to do it urgently because it's the only way to avoid the worst scenario on climate and biodiversity. Bio and the second thing, and the second message is that we, we need to work together. So firms, we have to do it better. And we are working on that and, and we will. But we also need your help, you know, as civil society, NGOs, administration, 
to accelerate the, the, the energy transition and especially to increase awareness among society on the implications of this energy transition. Thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations for the, for the alliance. I think you are extremely well positioned to, to really to, 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 to do something important on this very, very relevant field. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, thank you, Gonzalo, and thank you to refer to the coalition, to the alliance, that for me, it is a fantastic way of working together. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't have uh, more time just to say thank you again. And now back to you, Dean, to close today's event. So thank you, panelists, and see you soon. No, that's great. Thanks very much uh, to all the panelists and to Manuel for, for helping to explore the positions of the different stakeholders related to energy and nature. And before we close, I'd just like to very quickly highlight three main follow-up actions from today's launch of the, uh, the Clean Action Nature Safe Energy Report. As I said at the start of the event, the report's intended to be the, the start of a process to bring more attention to the energy nature climate trilemma. And for all of us to work together, um, as we just have heard from Gonzalo, working together, we need to take the necessary action. So firstly, please take note of the Clean Action email address. So cleanaction at www.int.org. And contact us if you'd like any more details, if you'd like to share your own experience or if you'd like to discuss any other issues related to energy and nature. Secondly, please tell us which actions recommended in the Nature Safe Energy Report, which of those actions do you think should be given priority? We clearly can't address all of these recommendations immediately, so we'd like to be sure which of those should be given the most priority. And it's your voice that's going to count on that. And, and thirdly, finally, please let us know if you'd like to join Clean Action as a member or if you'd like to partner with Clean Action or to support our activities. Certainly, we can be more effective with more organisations aligned to our energy nature objectives. So with that, I'd just like to thank everyone who's joined us today to hear about Clean Action's Nature Safe Energy Report. And we hope to hear from you all again very soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>